Welcome to lecture 29. So, we will just briefly review what we did last time and uh, continue with fixed points. <coughs> so, so, I showed you some important combinators yesterday k s omega b, there is another important combinator w which I will mention when it comes. Um, okay. And then, uh, so we were looking at data structuring in the lambda calculus, how to represent data as functions. So, here are the truth values uh, true and false uh, and um, of course, we are still in, we are in an untyped world. So, you can always ask whether a given, I mean we will talk about numeral representations, you can ask for example, whether a numeral is true or not. I mean, I mean it is syntactically possible, not that it should be allowed, okay. But where it uh, and you might get, you might actually get some answer, but that is the problem with it, with the untyped world. Uh, then we also had uh, pairing the pairing function again with its constructor and deconstructor. You, uh, you can of course, apply the deconstructor if you have already applied the constructor and then you are guaranteed that you will get the components which were used for, used for the construction of the pair, but you cannot apply a deconstructor and then up to, uh, and then apply the constructors to expect to get the same term back, right. So, uh, using pairing inductively we might define uh, n tuples and uh, uh, for both uh, the construction and the deconstruction and we looked at this. We can also define sequences in this form and for which uh, this is the constructor and uh, you will have deconstructors like this, which look like this. So, you want to be able to project out the ith component uh, and get this and if you use this combinator u i n, which has n abstractions uh, and then you put that into this and make this application, then you will get uh, the ith component of the sequence. And of course, the last and most important things, how do you represent the naturals in, uh, in the lambda calculus. So, we will look at the representation of numerals. Uh, the representation of numerals is actually a very important uh, feature of the lambda calculus. Unfortunately, and, but the only thing is that there are uh, lots of different representations of numerals and uh, they were used because as I said, Church's original agenda for the lambda calculus was to be able to show what exactly is computable and what is not, right. And so, there was a growing body of work called recursive function theory, which was really a set of functions which can be programmed, uh, which, which, which people thought could be, uh, could be mechanizable at that time. So, and uh, the natural numbers formed an important part of that. So, you, to represent the naturals, this is not Church's original notation, this is not, this is not Church's original representation, his original representation is a little more complicated <coughs> and uh, it does not satisfy some nice properties. So, you just take the, the i combinator, the identity function itself as 0, okay. And this n plus 1, I am writing n plus 1 because, well I do not know what else to write. I mean I could have written n prime maybe, okay. But this, this whole thing is not supposed to be an addition, it is supposed to be a single combinator, yeah. This single combinator is just the ordered pair falls with the representation of n. So, essentially uh, since it is an inductive definition, essentially what it means is that a natural number uh, other than uh, the, so 0 is represented by the combinator i and any other natural number is actually an ordered pair of false. So, there will be some n falses and then i except that they will all be nested within the pairing functions. So, it is a pair containing false and another thing which is a pair containing false and something else which is a pair containing false and something else and so on and so forth. Right, uh, and uh, and of course, what you require is the successor function in RPN arithmetic, 
and uh, this was a successor function is just defined in terms of pairing, right. So, given any x, the successor of x is just the ordered pair formed by false and x. And we can actually take the predecessor function and the predecessor function is just for any x, its predecessor is, is obtained by applying that x to the combinator false. Of course, 0 should not have a predecessor, but then there is no question of undefinedness and so on and so forth in this case. So, the predecessor of 0 is taken to be 0 itself. So, if you actually apply uh, i to false, if you actually apply i to false, what you will get is Oh, you will get false. Huh, you will get false. So, this is not right. So, uh, so this is so this is one of those things which uh, you know in, in the untyped world this is one of those expected things. It is expected in the sense that you can get unexpected results when you do something that you are not supposed to do like finding the predecessor of 0. Right, um, and but however, the predecessor of n plus one would be n. Right, uh, then there is of course a zero predicate, which is just the natural number applied to true. Okay, and uh, you will be able, you will be able to get both true and false answers from this. And uh, once you have this, you can basically define other, all other functions are naturals using these, right. So, there is no problem about it. So, essentially we have looked at data structuring. The most important data structuring facilities are you should be able to represent booleans and numbers. Uh, real numbers are just ordered pairs of natural numbers. I mean, integers are just ordered pairs of a sign bit and a natural number. So, you know the sign bit can be an boolean or an, and a natural number. So, I mean integers, reals, floating point, it is all, it's all trivial. Once you have represented numerals, <coughs> those things are trivial. And of course, we have looked at the basic data structuring facilities, forming pairs, tuples and sequences. And essentially, you have the power of, <coughs> excuse me, you have the power of essentially the data structuring facilities in any programming language. Right, but okay. So now we'll come to an important. So let me tell you a story. <clears throat> In a forest of lambda terms, <laughs> there was once a young combinator. Once upon a time, in a forest of lambda terms, there was once a young combinator called Y. So, people asked why, why <laughs> and they got back the reply because why, why, why. So, people asked, but why, 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 why and they said, well, because why, 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 why and it went on, okay. And that is this young combinator looks like this, okay. Now, if you, if you, if you take, take, take a careful look at this, I have, of course, I have followed structured programming facilities and provided abstraction and so on and so forth. So, I have given a new name V to this lambda term and Y is lambda X V V where V is this. Now, uh, so essentially if I remove, if I substitute, I mean if I remove this V and write out the full lambda term, this combinator looks like this. So, lambda x, lambda y, x applied to y applied to y, this whole thing applied to itself, okay. <coughs> now, uh, we have seen a similar combinator, something that looked a bit similar, um, which was the omega combinator, okay. Anyway, so, this uh, combinator, which I will keep away here. 
so here is why colorfully embellished uh, so that you can distinguish all the terms okay so and the combinator omega that we had was somewhat similar to this i mean except that there was no none of these x's here and there was in this abstraction over x okay and if you just throw your mind back to what we said about omega omega keeps beta reducing to itself or to an alpha version of itself right okay so it's so omega is uh, sort of the the ultimate in undefinedness because it's an infinite computation which doesn't show any output okay it's really like an infinite loop but so if you take this y instead which is not quite that okay if you perform this beta reduction you get something else i mean you don't really get what the effect of y but you do get some form of infinite computation okay so if you consider any term m and this by any term m i'm saying now you can include y if you like i mean the term m could be y itself which is why y y y y y y y y y and so on and so forth okay uh, now if i take if i apply y to m now what happens uh, so this is a there will be a beta reduction so because this 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 left bracket comes here and then this m comes here and then there's a closed right bracket uh, right parenthesis actually and then i can do this beta reduction i i don't do any of the, i don't do this application at all but what i do is i apply i do the beta reduction over this x then when i do this beta reduction over this x what it means is that this abstraction goes this application remains so this blue left parenthesis is not this one but this one okay and uh, lambda y and instead of x i put m y y and then again lambda y m y y right and now this is itself a beta reduction uh, this is a beta red x and i can apply it and i can apply beta reduction to it <coughs> and when i do that what i get is this so so this is the beta reduction uh, so what it means is that each of these light ochre colored y's will be replaced by this orange term right so when i do that replacement i get this m applied to this thing the blue brackets of course gone away due to the application <coughs> but the but the, so this ochre bracket is this ochre bracket and this ochre bracket is this ochre bracket and these two ochre brackets are these two ochre brackets right and each of these y's has been replaced by this term which of course i have written in orange and red to distinguish them right now what is this term this whole term which has been underlined in green is just y applied to m right so now what so what is the moral of the story you get that y applied to m is beta equal to m applied to y applied to m and that is beta equal to m applied to m applied to y applied because i can take this y m and do a beta reduction and get another copy of m applied to y applied to m and and so on and so forth okay <clears throat> and of course if i if if instead of m i used y then i get y applied to y y applied to y applied to y y applied to y applied to y applied to y y applied to y applied and so on and so forth the moral of the story is that there is this this combinator y has a peculiar property and that is that given any term m it automatically gives you a fixed point of m okay so 
so this since so if you look if if we think of these uh, uh, lambda terms as being uh, functions then this equation is really equivalent to a function with something which says so if i take this y y m as some n uh, as some x so then what happens is that if x is equal to y m then what I get is that x is equal to f of x where f is m which by definition is a fixed point ok. I mean when is x a fixed point of a function f so when x equals f of x. Right. So, up to beta equality the y when applied to any combinator when applied to any lambda term automatically gives me a fixed point of that lambda term. So, uh, right. so, so what happens is that so I can always find fixed points by just applying the combinator uh, applying the combinator y on a term. So, I, what I mean is I can get something that satisfies such an equation yeah and the property about fixed points of course is that I mean in normal ma going back to our normal mathematics is that ok if x equals f of x then I can apply f on both sides and I get f of x equals f of f of x. But I already know that x equals f of x so this equals this and I can go on ad infinitum. So in fact I can keep on applying f again and again right that is what we do and that is that is the property of a fixed point. So uh, here essentially the same effect has been obtained right it is so this y applied to m is x this m is f then we get x equals f of fx equals f of f of x equals f of f of f of x and so on and so forth right <coughs> ok. So what is the importance of fixed point operators right we have already seen fixed point operators right somewhere but the one important thing to notice ok uh, we will worry about that. So essentially so this folk tale actually is summarized in this so why is a fixed point combinator such that you can keep getting you can keep getting this sequence ad infinitum without any problem and we have seen other fixed points also right. So let us look at some other fixed points you have this uh, so instead of looking at mathematics we should actually look at programming. So we have the standard while loop for example in our imperative programming language and that is semantically equivalent to this. I mean in our operational semantics that is what we defined right. So this while loop is like some y some combinator y applied to something which includes b and c and the effect of that is to unfold the while loop ok that that something this that something with the, the m in this case is that something which contains b and b and c and this is exactly like and now I can unfold this while again and I can get an semantically equivalent construction like this and so on and so forth and I can keep expand unfolding that while loop again. In so each inside while loop can be expanded out into this and which is exactly what happens in this case. So if you look at if you look at this oh if you look at ah if you look at if you look at this then that is really what you are doing you have got some so so this 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 body uh, this context consisting of b and c <coughs> is the m here the while is just that y applied to m and the effect is to expand out the innermost while by creating a new copy of the body right. So 
you can just like you can by beta reduction go in this fashion what we are doing in our operational semantics in our implementations and so on is that we are gradually unfolding the while loop one at a time for each execution of the program. We are unfolding the while loop in terms of an if then. Yeah. So, this this y actually provides that the required unfolding that you want, how much ever you like. In the case of for loops for example, it is a finite number of iterations, so which means it is a finite number of unfoldings. In the case of while loops, it is actually an indefinite number of unfoldings, right. So, you take this innermost body, so this while loop actually is something of the form y app, y applied to m and it can be unfolded in each case to give you more applications of m onto itself right <coughs> and if you look at other fixed point equations in for example data and so on we actually have a similar we have a similar situation so take take an alphabet a and take the set of all finite sequences or finite strings on this alphabet. So, what is the set of finite strings on this alphabet? It is a set of it is it is the empty string and prefixing any string of the set by a letter of the alphabet okay, which is like a one step unfolding of A star. Okay. So, this epsilon union A prefix is actually like your m and the star is like y applied to A okay. and the result of that is to provide unfoldings of this of this form. Now, this A star in turn can be unfolded into this fashion, in, into this fashion and so on and so forth right. <coughs> you take in fact anything which has a fixed point this is what is going to happen. So, if, if you take this the collection of all finite and infinite strings on this set A then I can it has a basis which consists of all the finite strings and then union uh, prefixing of all strings in the, in the same set A infinity and this is like a finite unfolding you can go on in this fashion forever. So, this is you can think of this as a set of as a collection of equations which are all satisfied by a fixed point uh, by some by any function which has a fixed point. How do you get that fixed point by applying a y com uh, by applying the y combinator to any function yeah. So, the y combinator is actually quite interesting right. So, let us let us go back to this while loop <coughs> one of the things that I brushed aside when I was when I was defining the while loop semantics was that I said that it was not structurally inductive okay. <coughs> now, actually what we can do is we can define a structurally inductive semantics and that is very simple. What do I do? I have something consisting of the, the set of states, I have some set sigma right capital sigma which is the set of all possible states and I can take any mathematical domain including whatever are uh, whatever including this set of states and apply a lambda calculus on it. I mean in the sense that I can define an applied lambda calculus of the algebra of states. I, mean, I can take any mathematical domain and I can do lambda abstractions and so on. The lambda calculus is sufficiently independent to allow for such applications. We have already seen how you can get an applied lambda calculus on natural uh, natural numbers like piano arithmetic and so on. Do the same thing for states, then what it means is that in particular you can apply the y combinator on any function on states and you can get a fixed point. I mean that is what it guarantees, I mean you take any combinator, you can you take any lambda term and you apply the y combinator on it you get a fixed point and seeing how this while loop works means that it, we just have to find a fixed point on a function on states. That function on states is defined by the boolean condition and the body of the while loop 
right. So, here is the semantics. So, there is some function w which is defined as follows, okay. So, if the Boolean for example, starting in some state sigma evaluates to false, then this w b c on sigma evaluates to sigma and if b c goes to true, if, if b sigma goes to true and c sigma goes to some state sigma prime and w b c applied to the sigma prime goes to some sigma double prime, then w p c on sigma goes to sigma double prime. This w b c we know exists now, now we know that it exists because you can always have define an applied lambda calculus on the functions of states. You can always take the state space and use applied lambda uh, and, and include the uh, and on top of it have the lambda calculus, the pure lambda calculus sitting on the algebra of function states. What is It is some function which, which satisfies these properties. Note that these arrow marks for W B C do not have a label, okay. The label, if I have to give them a label, that label will be like the label that I defined for the applied lambda calculus on piano arithmetic. Each reduction is either a beta reduction or a piano reduction. In this case, this arrow would be either a beta reduction or some reduction defined on the set of states. Okay. So, may, may, so, I do not have subscripts on all arrows which deal with this, with this W B C, because this W B C note that it is it's, it's not green, I mean okay, uh, the W B C is the highest level of abstraction you can go to. So, it is a function of states. It is a function on states, okay. it takes one state to another state and it is a function on states which depends somehow on B and C. It is a function on states constructed from the behavior of B and C, okay. The, I mean, uh, I mean the, the only way you can apply that, you, the only way you can get a semantics of the while loop is that it should somehow depend on the Boolean and the body, right. What we do know from the, by, by putting the pure lambda calculus on top of whatever may be the calculus uh, for uh, whatever may be the reduction mechanism for states is that we still can get a y combinator. We, we still have the y combinator of the lambda calculus and for any term I am you can see that there are no constraints at all on that term m. That term m could be either pure or applied it does not matter. The only the point is that when this term is whether it is pure or applied we are not looking inside this term m right. So, we are not using the structure of m or the properties of m in any way. These beta reductions the y just allows that whatever may be this it might be just one ton of garbage too. I mean what, what it means is that it allows for a replication of that term. Okay. So, this the behavior of the y combinator is completely independent of this term m. This term m can be a pure lambda term, it can be an applied lambda term, it can be in any, it can be in any mathematical domain. Okay. And I am not looking into it, I am not manipulating m in any other way. All I am doing is I am this y just creates new copies for the application of m to it, to whatever is the rest, yeah. So, if m is actually a just a data object and therefore, it is not a function, what I will get is a, an applied lambda term which I cannot interpret, okay. But if this m is actually a function in some in my domain, in whatever domain of interest that I have, then what I get is an application of this function and I'm, I, and I am assuming a unary function. Uh, so, it means an application of this function repeatedly satisfying this fixed point equation, right.
So, this W B C is really constructed through the y combinator and what, what does it do? This W B C it just tells you the it, it just gives this beta reductions actually I mean straight away except that you might also mix beta reductions with the reductions in that in this in this uh, in this uh, algebra of states. And so, whatever <coughs> so if B is so the, so, the only constraints we are imposing on this function W B C is that if B in the state sigma is false, then W B C should do nothing and just return that state. If B in this state is true, then what should W B C do? It should be, it should iterate the body C once and then create whatever is the effect of W B C on the new state. So, this is iterating the body C once and on that new state find out whatever it, this W B C can do and that is what W B C can do on the original state sigma that you started out with. And so now this W B C of course depends only uh, if the rules for uh, so uh, remember that uh, uh, long, a long long time ago when I spoke about transition <coughs> systems I was saying that almost anything on earth can be represented as a transition system including functions. I mean after all why should not we have functions also represented instead of representing functions as equations I will represent them through this arrow mark through a transition as a transition right. So, the successor function applied on n goes to a transition which is n plus 1 right. So, so this W B C is actually a function. And what is this function? It is actually the function which somehow takes b and c creates a new function. Okay. So, it is really a function of this form. It is a function uh, let us say f b c on sigma right. So, this function is sigma if b is false and it is uh, whatever l l l uh, so uh, w whatever is the effect of c applied to f b c when sigma is true or rather it is f b c applied to c applied to sigma whatever the function c might be okay and this function so from the from the from the functions of b and c i somehow combine up uh, take and apply a y combinator onto them and i get this function wbc right and uh, and so i have just defined this function wbc in order to be consistent with our transition system semantics i have defined this wbc also through reductions but otherwise it's a function yeah and so now we have a purely structurally inductive definition for the while loop which is not really operational. So, if you ever do a course on semantics of programming languages one of the most important things is going to be the construction of fixed point co combinators. Sir, yeah. sir, in this second row hmm. two sigma dash are same in this second row sir. These two sigma primes are the same, these two sigma double primes are the same. Mm -hmm. I mean if B in the original state sigma evaluates to true in our original while language there were no side effects okay right but if supposing you had side effects and so on what it means is that i would just transform this sigma to some tau and work with that tau that's about all that's the only change that will happen in the root it's not going to affect the semantics of the while at all in any way so if b evaluates to true in this state sigma and one execution of the body of C actually <coughs> gives me sigma prime. This this actually should be a many step, a possibly many step evaluation, right? And if WBC is the function on on this new state sigma prime, the new sigma prime is obtained after one execution of the body of the while loop. 
if it gives me a final state sigma double prime then wbc on the original state sigma also gives me sigma double prime okay and uh, on the other hand if the boolean in the original state evaluated to false then wbc just leaves the state unchanged right and so the semantics of the while loop so this is really like the if then it's really the if then so the while loop is really the y combinator applied to an if then which is which is really what our which is really how our operational semantics works so there is this function made up of the booleans b and the body c which is really an if then function with some sort of a parameterized hole for it <coughs> and the while loop is just the y combinator applied to this yeah so <coughs> i don't want to <coughs> belabor the point it's just that uh, I, what i want to say is it's possible to define an inductive a structurally purely structurally inductive semantics for the while loop something that we had left uh, really undefined uh, we had we had given it an operational flavor in terms of implementations but if you want a st purely structurally inductive definition it's possible not that it's very easy to understand i can under i can see that it's quite hard to understand but anyway if you ever do a, a course on semantics of programming languages you will have to deal with fixed points uh, large numbers of them and it so happens that in the lambda calculus this this y was a combinator defined originally by church okay and <coughs> it satisfies it does not satisfy one very important property so <coughs> for any term m y applied to m is beta equal to this m <coughs> applied to y applied to m but y applied to m does not beta reduce to m applied to y applied to m yeah let's go back <coughs> why doesn't it beta reduce So, uh, we had this, right? Let me just find that out. Ah, here it is. Here it is. Why does not y apply to m beta reduce to? So, what have I done here? I have taken y applied to m and with one beta reduction I got this step. With another beta reduction I got this step but I inferred the beta equality from the fact that this is equal to y applied to m. It is going back, I mean going backward, but y applied to m does not itself reduce to m applied to y applied to m, okay, it does not by itself reduce, it is just that beta equality since it is defined as, it is defined in a fashion where, where you can either go forwards over reductions or backwards over reductions it does not matter then I would consider the two terms equal. It is because beta equality is defined in that fashion that y applied to m is actually equal to m applied to y applied to m, but y applied to m does not beta reduce to ah, does not beta reduce to m applied to y applied to m. And in fact, a nice property that we would like to have is really that it should be possible, uh, is it possible to find a combinator which will satisfy the property that whenever it is applied to a term, 
it beta reduces to this expansion. That is really what happens in our implementations, right. If you want to accurately model implementations, what you are doing is you are you, you are actually going through this beta reduction, you are not going through an equality. You are using the equality maybe to reason, but the actual execution of a let us say a while loop program is that you reduce that while loop program. If you go back to our original operational semantics, how, how did we define the original operational semantics of the while loop? Especially let us forget about the case when B, B is false, when B is true we wrote it as B sigma, if B sigma goes to true sigma, then we said that the while B do C sigma goes to C semicolon while B do C sigma, right. So, what we are defined here is a reduction, okay, this transition is like a reduction which actually expands out, which actually does the unfolding and this is an accurate rendering of how you actually, how your loop is actually implemented in, by a code generated, by the code generation procedure in your compiler. This is actually the way it is implemented. And so, what we would like to know is whether it is possible to have a fixed point combinator which actually does this unfolding, which for example, Church's Y combinator does not. And it turns out that Turing actually defined one which does, yeah, and you can check it out at home. <coughs> so, the Turing fixed point combinator T is defined in this fashion, uh, lambda y, lambda x, x applied to y, y applied to x and you can see that and uh, you can do your beta, beta, do beta reductions to see that it actually directly reduces in this fashion. So, it actually does the unfolding that you require for your implementations, yeah, right. So, let us uh, uh, you, you can try this out uh, yourself, I do not think it is a great deal of effort. The whole point is that you have to be careful in order to check, check such a thing, you have to be careful that you are not using the fact that you had named something before as something, you are not using that, that is what we did in the case of Church's Combinator, it does not directly reduce. You have to use the rules for many step beta reduction very, very rigorously, yeah. Uh, okay, so so now let's let's look at beta equality. Some of the things we have done over over the past few lectures is that uh, considering the way beta equality has been defined, uh, two terms are beta equal. In order to prove that two terms are beta equal, you can do one of the following. Well, one thing is directly reduce the left hand side term to the right hand side term L to M. Other possibility is you can directly reduce the right hand side to the left hand side and then they would be both be beta equal. A third possibility is that you reduce each of them to some common term, right. I mean, so let us look at the, uh, let us look at this beta equality from the point of view of our new beta equality, which includes alpha conversion. I mean, so you, so in, 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 in all these many step beta reductions, you might also have some alpha conversions in between. You can intersperse them any way you like, right. So, we will assume that alpha conversion, we, we would not explicitly mention alpha, alpha, alpha conversion, we will say that it is just syntactic, syntactically equal. So, strictly speaking what I would say is in order to prove L is equal to, L is beta equal to M by the third method, it means that you reduce them both independently to some two terms N and N prime which are mutually alpha convertible, 
if you like. But uh, as I'll consider alpha con alpha <coughs> alpha equivalence to be the same as syntactic identity. And so essentially, what it boils down to you can, is that you can reduce them both to some common term, and then when you reduce them both to some common term, you can claim that L is beta equal to M. There is actually a fourth possibility, and that comes from the fact that the operational semantics of the lambda calculus is not deterministic. What I can do is I can find a term P okay, which reduces by one way to L and by another way to M. I mean since the operational semantics of the lambda calculus is non-deterministic, it actually allows for this possibility. I mean so here is a so <coughs> this is <coughs> I am sorry, this is something that we, 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 we do not very often use because we are all too concerned with proving things by reductions. But there is also a method of proving things by abstractions, right? I mean, right? And so that you find a common abstraction from which both of these will reduce to these terms, maybe in two different ways. I have not yet, uh, I mean it is not clear the non-determinism of the operational semantics. Is, is there any guarantee? I mean that uh, otherwise we would not be able to use it directly. But what I am saying is that is something that we have to prove. How do, how do you know it will always work? I mean, No, you are saying that if it is not true then, uh, then, then we will not be able to use it, which is true. I, I exactly agree with it, but there is nothing in the development that we have said so far, which actually guarantees that you will find this end. What is there, what, what guarantees do you have? that you will actually be able to find a common end. It might sometimes be, there may not be a common end, always. I mean, so the fourth one does not necessarily reduce to the, f the third one. What we are saying here is, I look at the structure of L and M and I make a guess about a P, which is a lambda abstraction with an application maybe such that through a sequence of beta reductions I can get P, uh, L through another sequence of beta reductions starting from P because P might have more than one beta red x. So, so if you want to if L and M are distinct then P is something which which either has more than one beta red x initially or somewhere along the line through a common beta reduction it expands to a term which has more than one beta red x. And by applying them differently, by going through the beta reductions in, in two different ways, I might be able to get L and M. I mean, it's it's a feasibility. It's a feasible solution, but there are no guarantees that uh, all of them will reduce. So, so all I'm saying is, it's it's just like I mean, uh, given given a theorem to be proved, I mean, there are many different directions you can follow. Some of them might lead you to the conclusion; others may not. So, uh, so these two are not equivalent. These two are not equivalent, and there's no guarantee that they are going to be equivalent. Okay. So, but this last, uh, this last kind of alternative is something that we have not actually used in our manipulation so far, but it's uh, uh, it's certainly a feasible. Uh, it's certainly a feasible method. For example. I can take this combinator f. So, I can ask if for a given n the combinator f satisfies this beta equality, then what is f? Well, there is one way of looking at f. I will just say that f is this combinator, one of the most natural things. But then I decide I do not want this horrible thing. I will look for something else. I will look for a property. So, I will look for this. So, if f of x is 
if f applied to x is beta equal to this, then this is a self application, uh, this is a, a form of self application which is like, uh, which is like, so if I look at this structure, it is like n is applied to x is applied to x, okay, which is like a composition of two functions. So, I take the composition operation v and I redistribute the parenthesis in this fashion. Right now, I have a guarantee from the structure of b and by lambda reduction that I can actually get this by many step reduction from this. Okay. Now, there is a uh, one important combinator which I did not mention at that time was the w combinator which is just a diagonalization w is just lambda x uh, lambda y x applied to y x applied to y x applied to y y yeah right so then uh, if i if i look at this w then i can go backwards i i know that from w this way i can get this by beta reduction so i so now i have got two structures which are of the same form an x at, at the last a single x at the last and f applied something so this is something applied to x and so i can claim that f is w applied to b applied to n but then this is again like a function composition so i can look upon this as bw applied to b applied to n right so this is going backwards by the alternative four right and the important question that he has raised is really the last important thing is it really true that given a lambda term p and if it reduces in two different ways because of non determinism to l and m is it true that they will both eventually reduce to some common term we are too used to seeing such things being taken for granted in mathematics but we are there, there are as yet no guarantees that this property would actually hold in the lambda calculus right i mean this is a typical school <coughs> mathematics problem right i mean you can have two different solutions it's it shows non deterministic reductions it shows different applications of different formulae one uses <coughs> that the fact that a square minus b square is equal to a plus b multiplied by a minus b the other uses the fact that a plus b the whole square is equal to a square plus b square plus 2ab and and you get the same answer i mean we are used to getting the same answer that we take it for granted but how do you know it is actually going to happen and that is an important property and unless this is guaranteed this does not really model programming in any way and we have to somehow guarantee this yeah